Hello everyone, welcome to UMD Media. UMD Media works on understanding, measuring, and doing. And it uh, strives to contribute to evidence-based decision-making and discourse in the whole, specifically in Ethiopia. Today, I'll be conversing on Kovadis to Great Genocide, lessons from Rwanda and Darfur and elsewhere. And it's my great pleasure to have Dr. Mukesh Kapila as my guest today. Dr. Kapila, welcome to MD Media. Thank you. Thank you for talking to me. Great. So uh, I, uh, as always, I start with uh, introducing my guests and uh, with um, those who know you, know you very well, uh, no question about that. Uh, and uh, for those who uh, don't know you, but also for those who know you, but want to contact you, be you know, uh, in connection and so on, I just want to show uh, some uh, information. So this is, uh, as we speak, uh, the 225 day of the to uh, graduate genocide from November uh, 4th. We will be talking about whether it's genocide, war, civil war, and so on. But these are, you know, uh, big numbers that we see in terms of uh, victims, casualties, and so on. But as a man who knows what all this is about, you also mentioned about one person is too many. So what we are seeing here, there is a lot of life behind them and so on. So Dr. Kapila is very active, I must say, on Twitter. So this is his Twitter account, uh, an author, writer, professor, emirate, uh, a humanitarian, global health expert, and so on. Uh, on Facebook, this is his account uh, with two uh, his two books displayed on the uh, profile picture. Uh, I'll be talking about them in a bit. And this is for those who are in the uh, professional network, LinkedIn, uh, you can uh, get him there as well. Um, all of them are very active. Uh, I follow you uh, very closely in Twitter, but uh, I saw you are active in all platforms. And your career is amazing. Uh, you worked everywhere in different roles. Uh, what is a common denominator I found is the humanitarian aspect. You work with the people, you work for the people, you work at the grassroots level uh, and so on. And this is a very, uh, I mean, I, I must say, you know, uh, uh, well updated, well maintained, uh, a website of yours where people can get your blogs, your medias, uh, of course, your books, the two books, uh, and so on. And what I saw there is this, uh, you know, I don't, I, I didn't have the time to go to the details of the second one, but I, I tried to look at the first one in terms of what we are going to be discussing here today. So my first question is, when it comes to your vast experience uh, everywhere, uh, as is, uh, you know, mentioned here, I think this is a very small portion because I saw your interviews elsewhere. Uh, for example, North Korea is not mentioned here, or Afghanistan is not mentioned here, and so on. But you are everywhere from Cambodia to Rwanda, Iraq, both Northern and Southern, 
Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Darfur. And when you go through all this, what I saw common element was that you were, you know, uh, feeling that the institutions are not working, the international community is not responding, and so on. So I, in Darfur, everything changed. You went out to declare that not, you know, uh, under my watch, and so on. So after seeing all this, how come you are not tired of? You are still very active in terms of advocating for Tigray and you know tweeting uh, very frequently. What is driving you, Dr. Kapila? Well, what is driving me is really what I learned from uh, the people I've seen in the most horrible situations around the world. And by the way, that also includes uh, North Korea and, uh, and uh, Afghanistan. Um, I remember one person in particular in the Blue Nile uh, province of uh, uh, Sudan. And when I was there in relation to the genocide in Darfur, but also visiting other parts. And, you know, I thought that uh, she, uh, this lady I was talking to, one of the ethnically cleansed uh, people of the uh, peripheral belt of, uh, mm. of uh, Sudan at that time, uh, I thought that she would be very uh, depressed and very um, uh, kind of crushed down. Mm. Instead, I was doing some filming. Instead, what she did was she asked, actually asked my cameraman to come closer and take a good picture of her and, and said, go and tell my story to the world and tell them that though you have, you're only visiting me for a few minutes, I will still be here mm. and I am still resisting. Mm. So it seemed to me when people like her remain optimistic of their future in the middle of the most desperate circumstances, then people like me who live in much more privileged uh, uh, situations have no right to be pessimistic. So in a sense, uh, that kind of attitude has driven me from uh, one setting to another. And each setting I have, I have been to, I have actually, it has made my resolve even firmer and deeper that uh, these kinds of crimes against humanity cannot be allowed uh, to succeed. So that's what drives me. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a fair point. Uh, but you know, it's, you are not doing it without cost. Uh, let me play for uh, maybe our audience that uh, when you saw what you saw was in Rwanda and especially in Darfur, and after you moved to Geneva, because of what you did, uh, they don't want you to be out of the UN system. They won't still be, you know, at arm's length uh, or, you know, uh, reachable. So this is what uh, you said in December, I guess, uh, uh, talking to on the uh, glass. Sounds from the book, Mukesh, uh, that it left a deep um, wound on your own psyche to some degree. You describe yourself as a an insulin-dependent diabetic contemplating suicide uh, sometime after that experience? Yes, I mean, in this, in this book, uh, well, after Sudan, I found myself in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, and the way that happened was that when I spoke up, my time was end, at an end. One, I had death threats against me. And, uh, and of course, uh, I was still the UN coordinator. And, uh, the, and uh, so I had to uh, leave, really. For my own uh, safety, uh, I was uh, withdrawn, if you like. Uh, and anyway, in, uh, the uh, Sudanese government uh, was going to expel me anyway. And then, uh, but then the question was, what to do with Mukesh? And uh, and uh, the leadership, you and leadership at the time decided that um, Mukesh inside the system was better than Mukesh outside the system, uh, because at least inside the system, I'd be bound by some uh, code of conduct. Uh, mind you, I'd already flaunted that by going public on it. Though, you know, I looked at uh, all the rules and regulations. There was nothing rules and regulations that stops a head of an in-country UN mission uh, uh, to uh, speak 
to the media, though not in the code of conduct, that I needed to consult with anybody before I decided to speak up. Anyway, leaving that aside, uh, they, want, they didn't want me to leave the UN system. So a deal was done between uh, uh, Kofi Annan, uh, the UN, and the British government, because I was in secondment from the British government, I was still an official there, well, but not really an official, I was in secondment, and the World Health Organization, because they suddenly discovered or remembered as I did my, the emergency department of, uh, of the World Health Organization. And uh, there I languished, uh, you know, and uh, I realize now that uh, I must have been, I mean, I, you know, I knew about post-traumatic stress syndrome. This is described in the books. I've also studied the textbooks. And, uh, but my early time in Geneva, it was like I was living in cotton wool. Uh, you know, uh, I was just, uh, uh, I mean, I wasn't, uh, I literally, I was numb, uh, which I realize now is one of the symptoms of uh, PTSD. To the point that um, I was suddenly very depressed and to the point that I, I stock, started stockpiling insulin uh, because of course I knew how to commit suicide. Uh, all I had to do was inject enough suicide, it's uh, enough. So you, uh, do your uh, passion that's still with full energy and advocating for Tigray and elsewhere uh, in your tweets and in your social media uh, is not easy. Uh, but you, you are tapping into the optimist uh, woman that you saw before, right? Well, it's a combination of uh, learning some lessons from history, which have taught me from my visits, uh, from my experiences in Rwanda, Darfur, Srebrenica, and elsewhere that you mentioned, that uh, genocides ultimately don't succeed. Mm -hmm. So even though I've been in the worst situations in the world that you can think of, and I'm sorry to say, it, I didn't start on my career trying to be a specialist on genocide. Mm -hmm. It was just one of those uh, accidents of uh, an accidental career. Mm. That is down that path of going from one spot to another another spot. You see. But what I learned from that is that evil, it extracts a cost, but ultimately it will not succeed. So my the challenge I set myself really in uh, when I've been in office, when I've been in a high office, when I've been in low office, and when I'm in no office at all, is can we reduce the time between the evil being perpetrated and it being stopped so as to reduce the human cost. So that's what drives me on top of a sense of duty in relation to those people who are resisting on the ground. Mm -hmm. Other thing that drives me, by the way, I should add, and uh, here you're getting an exclusive because, uh, I, you know, as you'll have read from the book, I had uh, death threats. And I've been having death threats in uh, mm -hmm. in Geneva, where I landed after Darfur, and uh, and now recently uh, I've been of course hounded by uh, Ethiopian uh, trolls and Eritrean trolls as well because they noted my position on Tigray and my assertiveness on, on speaking up to what I know to anyone who will uh, who will listen. So mm -hmm. abusive, threatening messages have also come now. But let me tell all the trolls who might be listening to you. Mm. Uh, I have now upgraded my security. I've got new doors and windows. I upgraded the alarm systems in my house. And uh, I have actually reduced geographical uh, location. So people may not know at any moment in time where, where, I, where I might be. Mm. And even the backdrop you see in the, in the picture may not be a genuine backdrop. It may be just what I put up to fool people. So. Mm. Uh, so the, the 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 point I'm here uh, trying to uh, trying to make is that these threats that have emerged, they 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 comforted me into the point that people would not seek to threaten me unless they felt that what I had to say was an inconvenient truth and mm. I was on the right uh, track. Mm. And every time I'm threatened, it just simply makes it uh, more and more determined to mm. add my own voice to the resistance that mm. has to take place wherever the, a crime against humanity is being uh, committed. Mm, yeah, uh, it's, it's sad, you know, um, you are a man who were facing 
for example, in Darfur case, uh, Kofi Annan and, you know, uh, uh, people under him. Um, and then there are people now for your position for being on the right side of, you know, what's happening. They dare threat you, you know, and my point, uh, I mean, the question that I always ask is, if these people get a chance, what can, you know, what the damage they can do to people who can't protect themselves? Oh, you know? absolutely. Uh, I think uh, it's important for everyone to understand that sending a little tweet here or there is a very small contribution to the real act of resistance that mm. has to take place on the ground and in all ways that you can think of to mm. counter inhumanity and injustice wherever uh, wherever that uh, that may be but mm. no one should fool themselves that this is uh, cost free so you shouldn't become a fighter for justice or accountability or truth or humanity unless you are prepared to bear the cost with it. And today, the cost is physical, mm. the cost is emotional, mm. the cost is uh, also in terms of, uh, um, uh, you know, the constant sense of danger mm. that, that you get. And the more prominent you are, the higher the risk uh, that, that you face. Mm. So uh, if you're not prepared to pay that cost, then you shouldn't be in this particular uh, yeah. business. And that includes, I mean, the emotional cost. I mean, my hair is now almost white. At least I have some hair, Gepachu. I mean, you have a little less than me, but, uh, you know, uh, I might be getting there. But at least uh, it's white. And I can tell you this hair went white. Overnight almost, right, in Rwanda? In Rwanda. Yeah, I read that, yeah. And uh, and this is the price you pay. Yeah. And I, I never had diabetes before, but mm. actually dealing with Rwanda mm. obviously brought, brought up my internal vulnerability, if you if you wish. It mm. was an example of stress that actually worked through my body to, yeah. to trigger what was obviously an underlying condition, but it came out uh, soon after the 100 days of killings there in 94. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean... Um, the first time I think you went overseas, uh, the young man was to Cameroon, right? A totally, you know, different incident, different uh, context. But then that led to a number of uh, what we mentioned, and there are a number of that we are not going to mention. Uh, but coming back to Tugrai, uh, I was just, you know, tracking how and when you started talking about Tugrai. So I'm just wondering. Uh, if this was your first tweet, so the war started on November uh, 4th. So on the 19th of November, uh, because at that time there was this, uh, the Ethiopian government was, you know, going crazy, accusing uh, Dr. Tiros and so on. So this is your first tweet I found related to Tigray. I could be wrong, but where you say, wow, you know, uh, they are going after him because of his ethnicity and uh, so on. So how and because I will go through this, you know, your tweets, because I see a very good evolution of even the use of terminologies and so on, because my hope is at the end of the show, from the man who have seen everything to understand the context, what's happening, but also what could happen in terms of uh, the international community and so on. So, is this your first tweet? Oh, well, thank you for reminding me. I will, uh, if you say so, uh, but I will, I can go back and uh, check as well. But the more than likely, more than likely, you're correct. Yeah. So, uh, as we move, you know, uh, then the things, you know, before the end of the year, you tweeted some more as well. So, I could see, you know, calling it civil war, crisis. Uh, and so on. So moving forward, uh, because there are people who specifically, as you mentioned, because they want to avoid the responsibility to act, they don't they don't call it to graduate on no side, right? Uh, but you mentioned, uh, you, you know, you cite a number of things. So this is early February 
a list of people who died because of starvation. And I was talking to Alex Doyle the other day and I was asking him if the situation in Tigray is famine. And his answer was, you know, if what's happening in Tigray is not famine, then the word famine has no meaning. And you talk about mass starvation. So you have seen also this in, uh, you know, other contexts as well. So, but on, uh, you know, uh, I'll come back to this one. So my point is, when and how did you just uh, was able to say what's happening in Tigray is genocide? Well, first let me say that the word genocide is a very heavy word. And uh, uh, no one wants to use this word lightly. And the reason for not using it lightly is that if you cry wolf too much, then of course, uh, when the wolf comes, nobody is going to uh, believe you. You know that story. The other uh, thing to say is that genocide is often very disempowering because it's such a heavy word. It is like saying, oh, all is ho hopeless and helpless and uh, it's all over, if you like, you see. So I, for one, have been extremely reluctant to use the word genocide until I was satisfied in my own mind and by collating and studying all the information that I could find from a reported and uh, unreported sources. And this is where Google comes in very useful because thanks to Google Translate, uh, I can also uh, read Amharic and some of those other languages in which people tweet in and uh, make up my own conclusions from uh, the debate that has been taking place in, in the region itself, thanks to Google Translate. And of course, uh, getting the evidence from the media and the independent observers that have been going on the, on the ground, including the refugees now who are in, uh, in Sunan. So when you look at these factors, and you put the pattern together, slowly the terrible uh, thing dawned on me. My God, what I was seeing here seemed to be an action replay of more or less what I had also personally experienced in uh, Darfur when I was the head of the United Nations in, in the Sudan at that, at, the, at that time. And it seemed to me there were so many features in common in the Tigray of, of this year and the Darfur of 2003, 2004 that I was heavily involved in. And when those two patterns came together, it was, I had to admit to myself that I could not avoid using that word if I was uh, going to be honest with my own self. Mm. So mm. this was not, uh, this was a progressive realization mm. as more uh, information, evidence and analysis uh, came to came to light, and the patterns became clear. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in in uh, in Ethiopia, but I am an expert, unfortunately, in patterns of behavior, mm -hmm. and I am an expert on genocidal patterns of behavior from uh, virtually every single genocide that has been uh, done since the end of the Second World War through my personal visits to those places, either during the genocides or in the, uh, in the immediate aftermath uh, uh, period. So it doesn't matter where such types of violence takes place or what the differences in politics, ethnicities, cultures, religions are. There is a certain universality about the genocidal process, if, uh, if you like to see. Mm -hmm. And so putting those patterns together, that universal pattern, unfortunately led me to the conclusion uh, in about a month, month or so ago, quite definitely, maybe about six weeks ago, that what was going on in Tigray uh, had to be called the genocide. Hmm. In fact, you know, uh, like you mentioned, um, from that November 19th tweet, uh, I was tracking, you know, following as uh, I was re getting ready for this. So you are right. You didn't just decide suddenly and without uh, thought. So this is March 6th. That's the first actually... In a, uh, in a tweet where you use genocide, you know, hashtag genocide and Tigray in the same tweet without even uh, saying it, you know, Tigray genocide. Then of course, uh, like you said, uh, this is where you mentioned about the, you know, what happened elsewhere. 
uh, what's happening elsewhere as well as we speak. But then uh, this March 6th, so May 15th is the first time where you can you say, we must be crystal clear, this is genocide. This is uh, together with the Telegraph uh, reporting and so on. So this is the first time where you are uh, talking about, uh, you know, Tigray as a genocide, actually a long article citing you based on uh, your experience. And uh, this one even, you know, clearly uh, connecting to your Dar Darfur experience was from the same day, uh, May 15th. So uh, given that we have this established in terms of what's happening based on your experience, based on uh, the, the science, the uh, vital science and so on, this is uh, a genocide. I want to speak to, uh, because people like me, we felt like now, you know, in, in hindsight, we, we think that there were signs of their, you know, in the media, you know, in terms of uh, dehumanizing, uh, targeting uh, ethnic Tigray and so on. But this is, we're just realizing now. So is there any, uh, it's hard to say a blueprint, but is there any vital signs that people should have seen early on in terms of, uh, you know, different uh, precursors and setting up this genocide based on your experience? Uh, <laughs> a, a very good question and an extremely tough question. In retrospect, we can say that uh, perhaps the way that the acute phase of the conflict started around November last year mm. was so vicious right from day one that perhaps that was a precursor of mm. what was to follow. But you know, it's easy to us to for us to sit here in 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 uh, in, uh, in June mm. um, and. Uh, to, to claim that. Mm. The problem is, uh, well, there are two forms of genocide in my experience of uh, various places I've been to. One is a creeping genocide. And that is people start with the intent to commit genocide right from the very beginning, right? Mm. That's not a creeping genocide. That mm. is an intestinal genocide planned that way. Mm -hmm. And then there's a creeping genocide that they intend to be cruel, but they don't intend genocide. But then circumstances get out of control. And the perpetrators or the commanders who are giving the orders to commit all forms of cruelties, they lose control of the field dynamic that they have started. Mm. And then what happens is, the genocide becomes de facto, even if it was not intended at the beginning. Now, the key question in Tigray, therefore, is did Ethiopia start off, did the, uh, uh, do the leaders in Addis, aided by Eritrea, or the leaders in Eritrea, with the connivance of the uh, leaders in, uh, in uh, Addis, did they start off with the intention to commit uh, genocide, or as they intentionally committed more and more vile cruelties, they lost control of the situation to the point that it doesn't matter what they intended, the acts they were doing are genocidal in nature. Now, so I can say with, with, uh, with uh, reasonable certainty that uh, from the evidence that has been gathered by many, many uh, people uh, who have every reason to minimize what is going on, not to maximize what is going on, that even those who mini want to minimize what's going on, the evidence they've collected seems to lead me to the conclusion that what has been going on progressively this year, uh, uh, week after week, month after month, I've, I've been acts of genocide, first in local context, in local situations, in, in a town, in a, in a symbolic uh, place like Aksum or in other places. Mm -hmm. And then as they became widespread, they coalesced 
until the whole region was one setting, what I've called a, a one vast crime scene, right? So the act of genocide coalesced to become a, a bigger genocide, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the problem in, our, in uh, the debate that is paralyzing the international community is in calling it genocide, not calling it, it genocide, is the question of intent. I mean, uh, you know, the Nazis during the Second World War did uh, terrible things, as you know. But mm. it's only when the concentration camps were liberated and the documentation of the Nazis was analyzed by experts that we understood in retrospect that what they had been planning was extraordinary acts of annihilation, the Holocaust. Mm. Right? Mm. So, uh, so now, and of course, uh, at that time, the, the Nazis they were extremely good at uh, documentation. Today, uh, today's genocidaires are far smarter. We live in the age of WhatsApp. We mm. live in the age of uh, vanishing WhatsApps even. Mm. Uh, we live in the age of uh, uh, technologies which allow us to command, control, direct, um, organize, coordinate, leaving no trace behind, if you like. Mm -hmm. And in an age where we can hide our monies in bank accounts all over the world through all sorts of proxies and, uh, and through proxy servers, we can uh, do things, then don't be surprised that to try and gather evidence for intention is going to be very difficult. However, that doesn't stop us from calling what is going on uh, as genocide. In other words, we have to distinguish between uh, the acts or the situation as we find it, mm. uh, analysis of the qualifying actions that meet the definition of genocidal acts as per the Genocide Convention. Mm. And it's clear, everything that is going on in Tigray are genocidal acts. Deliberate famine, deliberate sexual uh, violence, deliberate population displacement, deliberate uh, destruction for means of life, delib deliberate cultural destruction, these are all genocidal acts mm -hmm. as defined by mm -hmm. the Genocide uh, Convention. Okay, There is absolutely no doubt about that. Now, from that, to then bring a charge of genocide against an individual is something that is going to require a lot more forensic analysis and a lot more independent investigation, which I'm afraid we are not getting now, and this is where I think we get into another territory of discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to the investigation part, yeah. Uh, on the precursors and so on, uh, in your book, uh, this is um, the uh, Against uh, Tide of Evil. So you, uh, on the last chapter, you mentioned five points in terms of the common elements or what genocides uh, look like, irrespective of where they are happening and so on. Like you mentioned, uh, you are clear in your tweets as well, there is unique situations happening in every place, but these are the common elements. So I just want to pick on the first two. So the first one you are talking about the planned intent that you are mentioning and organized effort. Uh, so on the uh, authority, so is it always governments I mean, governments will be there, but uh, with the state mach machinery and so on. So is there anywhere where um, we have seen other elements also collaborating with that? But the second point is my, what I was, uh, you know, in advance where people were targeted and hate speech or hatred uh, targeting because of uh, either ethnic, social, religious and so on. and. I tried to go to uh, Rwanda, and in Rwanda, you know, uh, they have this website where they, uh, I think it means uh, remember, Kuvikwa. Yeah, remembrance, yeah. Yeah, so there are, they have a timeline. Actually, they trace it back to the 1916, but I didn't go uh, as far as that. So I just picked some of these uh, media elements where they declare a uh, number of things, including, you know, um, the uh, Ten Commandments, uh, and then 
actually you you mentioned somewhere uh, this final solution you know quote unquote shows up everywhere almost uh, it was in darfur i guess as well when they were trying to delay uh, the peace deal right the north south peace deal but you uh, you mentioned also maybe it was in the holocaust as well as the final solution so this is uh, march 28 1994 where they talk about the rtlm on the population to exercise self defense for a final solution i you know uh, we have a video i mean i'm not going to play it because it's an amharic but we have a video from one of this uh, uh you know us based media five years ago they were exactly talking about now the final option is to recognize the fight is between 5 million and 95 million so it was not anymore you know uh you know opposing this government or tplf it's a fight between 95 million and 5 million and so on so that you know fits exactly what is happening here so can you speak to you know this kind of uh how they were in darfur or elsewhere in terms of uh precursors that should have been you know alerting the nation or those who are you know in the authority to do so uh, sure i mean uh, firstly i think uh, i want to emphasize your very first point in my long and unfortunate experience i have never been in a situation where there has been proven genocide like Srebrenica, like cambodia rwanda Darfur, and I can go on, where the genocide has not been committed by a government, okay? Mm -hmm. Gen genocide is by and large a state act. And it's extremely important that in a genocidal situation, the first, uh, uh, the first suspect is the government, if you like. Mm -hmm. That is not to say that uh, there aren't, uh, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda or... Uh, uh, you know, Boko Haram, who are, etc., who are not committing terrible acts. Mm. Uh, uh, we have atrocities that are happening everywhere in the world, unfortunately, here and there, etc. But when you look at what we might call a genocide, as opposed to just a crime against humanity, to make the distinction, a genocide has never been committed except by a government. Give me one example, well, uh, mm. since at least uh, the, uh, the, the Second World War. Mm. So when we speak about a Tigray genocide, suspect number one is the government of Ethiopia and the government of Eritrea, if you like. No question. Mm. Now coming to your uh, to your uh, uh, to your uh, uh, sort of issues around uh, precursors and language and and so on and so forth. Well. If we look into what's going on in a number of uh, countries, by the way, even here uh, in Europe uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, or in uh, India, where uh, I, my country of, uh, of birth, mm -hmm. and especially in today's age of ubiquitous uh, media, both social and uh, mass media, uh, you know, people say all sorts of things all the time, uh, uh, in a way. And uh, there are all sorts of intolerant people uh, out there. And no culture or society has a monopoly of uh, their uh, kind of nasty uh, sub-segment of mm. in, in, intolerant uh, people or divisive people or racist people or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, you know, uh, who are not just violent, but who are, in a sense, uh, haters of, mm. of others. The analysis of what was going on in terms of the segment of Ethiopians speaking in a language that we can call hateful is that when you put it all together and you add it with leading personalities and authorities in, uh, in positions, either condoning or uh, in a sense, encouraging these things, then that builds up a pattern 
of saying, okay, we of course, as authoritative figure, we can't say these things, but uh, we are not going to stand back and not allow these things to be said. I don't know if I'm being clear in, in, in what I'm saying, but it is not just hate speech by, by speaking. Mm. It is the hate speech by toleration of the hate speech. Mm. If, if, if you if you like, yeah. I mean, if, if you look at my own uh, country, but in India, mm. I am totally appalled by the intolerance that uh, my country birth is uh, is ridden by paroxysm mm. after paroxysm. Every few years, they go into a into a, into an epidemic of of violence mm. uh, on religious grounds, on caste grounds, or some some other grounds. Mm. And then different governments at different times in India's long history have been more or less tolerant of that, using it for their own political purposes at that moment in time. Mm. Luckily, the diversity of India and the general wisdom of Indian culture has meant that these paroxysms come and go. They hurt people, they kill people, they brutalize people. But in the end, yeah. if, you, if you like, it's the politicians who go uh, mm. and the, the people carry on, uh, carry on existing. In the case of Ethiopia, uh, which is equally diverse nation as India. I mean, uh, mm. you know better than I how many mm. uh, ethnic, uh, so-called ethnic groups there are and languages and cultures. And mm. after all, Ethiopia uh, or the region which we call Ethiopia now uh, yeah. is a kind of like a cradle of civilization uh, in a way in Africa and beyond Africa. We know that. Mm. So uh, what is the point I'm making? The, the point I'm making is it, it is not just the fact that in every society there are a bunch of people who are uh, uh, kind of careless with the words or uh, misinformed or uh, uh, occasionally nasty i mean it's like sometimes in the in the playground when you get bullied but not all bullies grow up to become uh, uh, mm. you know uh, genocides yeah mm. so I, I so i would say especially knowing that genocide is a state act we cannot simply blame the general background prevalence of uh, people saying horrible things about each other mm. as somehow justifying mm. the coalescence of policy mm. that led to the genocide the acts mm. that we have seen in the last six months in mm. Mm. so it's extremely important that because if you were to say that hate hate language leads to genocide then what you're doing is, and of course, genocide is accompanied by and preceded by hate language. That is well known from mm. Nazi time, from uh, in uh, in Rwanda time, with uh, you know the the Hutus against the Tutsis, uh, in the in the, in the Bosnia times, as I saw for myself against the Muslim there, etc. Of course, it's it's the hate language is there, and the hate language is both a precursor, but it is only a tool, mm. a tool that is that is used purposefully mm. for those who are clever and smart to use such tools. Mm. Remember one thing, Getacho, mm. no genocide in history has ever been committed by a stupid man. Mm. Stupid people, they're far too stupid to commit genocide. You, you only have to read uh, Hitler's uh, Mein Kampf, a, a very unreadable book, by the way, it's very badly written. However, mm. You can see his evil genius coming, uh, Hitler's evil genius coming through. Mm -hmm. And similarly, because genocide requires an organization, stupid people or ordinary people mm -hmm. do not commit genocide because they're not clever enough, mm -hmm. they're not smart enough, they don't have the management degrees that you need, mm -hmm. the, uh, the high skills of organization that you need in order to orchestrate the acts of intense focus cruelty which satisfied the genocide convention mm -hmm. so, yes hate speech and there was it uh, true in ethiopia but there's been these things going on for decades there's hate speech all over the world but all situations don't turn into genocidal acts so mm -hmm. no 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 we cannot allow the authorities in ethiopia or Eritrea to get away with yeah. that we cannot say mm -hmm. we cannot say that uh, oh it's a divided society and those divisions uh, i don't know some 
things uh, bubbled up and now uh, uh, terrible things are happening. Mm. Mm. That would be governments getting away from the responsibility. Mm. Uh, I see your point. Uh, so the, the, any head speech that was, I mean, the one I mentioned and so on, uh, actually are part of and par part and parcel of government effort to, you know, cover up and so on. Actually, I want to share with you this. Uh, in my effort to understand what was going on, this is the structure that I see time and again, you know, blackout as you know information blackout no internet no communication and then when there is a leak of information coming out they deny you know with all the force they have and they try if they can't deny they try to undermine you know and then uh, they justify and repeat the cycle right so uh, all the media that i was mentioning in terms of precursor uh, and so on they were in my view setting up this, uh, you know, because you mentioned in that first point, it's about targeting, dehumanizing, uh, then it becomes, you know, ripe for the structure, the machinery, uh, state machinery to operate. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, based on this. Can I interrupt you? Yeah, uh, sure, please. I think this is great, but you've forgotten one uh, small uh, thing, which uh, maybe you can update this figure, which, by the way, is good. Mm. And that is, there's another strategy to feed into this, and that is intimidate and uh, um, frighten off the, dis mm. the detractors. Yeah. And that's what we're also seeing now in relation to anyone who speaks up, they're either thrown out of the country or worse, things happen, they disappear. Mm. And so I think you need that, uh, which is, uh, I think, phase uh, whatever it is, of the thing. And we're seeing this, by the way, elsewhere as well. In the way, for example, the Chinese government is behaving in terms of tracking uh, those who attack them in relation to the, uh, to the happenings against the Uyghurs in, uh, uh, in Xinjiang, or the way the, the Burmese uh, junta is acting against uh, those who are critical of them uh, for the situation in Myanmar, including the, the, the Rohingya. Mm -hmm. And that is one thing. So. And that leads me to say, stimulated by your excellent question, that to me, I think even though I have seen many genocidal situations, even as they were unfolding, this is the smartest uh, genocide I've come across in Tigray. Why? Because the state of Ethiopia is far more developed than, for example, the state of Sudan was when I was confronting Darfur. Mm. Uh, in uh, in 2003, 2004. And the tools available to the powerful state of Ethiopia, including information technologies, including weaponry, mm. including networks, including resources, including uh, uh, external partnerships, are much greater than the tools that are available to President al-Bashir and his country in uh, in uh, in Khartoum uh, during the Darfur Darfur time, so it's important when we analyze the the Tigray genocide that uh, we look at the patterns, but we also understand that this is uh, 2020 2021. We are living in the most modern of ages, and hence we are seeing the most modern of genocides. Mm. Uh, you, you have a, a very good point. Actually, that reminds me what you were saying when uh, our Canadian general was uh, sending messages from Rwanda, he was using fax. Uh, and you were in the age of email in Darfur, and now uh, in Turai, uh, it's a different uh, element, like you said, with, in terms of the, uh, I mean, for example, drones, right? Uh, so what killed everything uh, for Tigray was the uh, drones used uh, during the first, uh, I don't know, three, four months and so on. So it's a, a modern, high-tech uh, genocide, including, uh, actually, you know, um, my guest this week before you was uh, uh, Thomas Hammerberry. Uh, does that click? Uh, the, the, does that name click? Uh, because he mentioned in his... I think one page and half later to the uh, Swedish uh, foreign minister, uh, he cited you there, uh, the most 
uh, you know, uh, known expert in this, and he was uh, talking about how the Tigray genocide uh, is something that should get the highest attention. And I was talking to him about uh, that, and I, I mentioned to him I was going to talk to you next after him, uh, and so on. So he mentioned the chemical weapons used as well, uh, and so on. So that's something that uh, is getting uh, attention as we speak. So m m maybe, you know, talking about lessons from other countries and so on. So I just want to share your uh, tweet here where you talk about the better or not. So during your time, you were the man who stood to power, I mean, who spoke to power in terms of, uh, I mean, the details when I read what you did in four phases or three phases, you tried to talk to the government, to the embassies there, and you had to move around, you know, the capitals from London to Washington DC, to Ottawa maybe, and so on, right? Uh, and you, you tried to compare on this uh, May 17th tweet, uh, at least the UN bodies, uh, some of, uh, you know, your counterparts this time, uh, they are better and they are standing up. Uh, and then you mentioned, you know, the political leadership is still, actually you are uh, just clear about that in uh, most of your tweets. But at the same time, you talk about the failure of the UN and the AU, and it's a rerun of Darfur. So I just want to uh, get what your assessment is uh, as we speak today, uh, June 16. Are we better off in terms of this institutional setup compared to what you had in Darfur when you were in Darfur and in Rwanda? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I think. Uh, a lot of progress has been made, okay? In my time, in the early 2000s, the UN was truly cowardly and would refuse to speak up. And Kofi Annan, rest in peace, did speak up, but it was often late. He was my direct boss when I was in uh, dealing with, uh, with with Darfur. But his success, but successor Ban Ki Moon, put in place a system which liberated individual UN agencies to speak in the area of competence. I remember sitting behind uh, Ban Ki Moon uh, in uh, Kigali on the 25th anniversary when he apologized, 20th or 25th anniversary, uh, and I remember him apologizing uh, for uh, the inaction in, uh, in uh, Rwanda in 1994. And, and I remember him saying, and I was just a few meters from him, a few inches from him, and he said, from now on, I want my representatives on the ground to speak up first and inform headquarters later. From now on, I want my representatives on the, on, on, on the ground being able to uh, tell it as it is and then argue later on, uh, et cetera. Now, I just wish that had been the case when I was the head of the United Nations in, 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 in the Sudan, okay? And uh, his spokesman then actually then apologized to me on Al Jazeera in a, in a public uh, a debate we were having uh, on, on, on things, saying that nowadays things are different. And today I am encouraged that the humanitarian side of the UN has been very outspoken, uh, including, for example, Mark Lokak, who incidentally was my boss in, uh, in the British government at the time that I was in the British government, and it's been very outspoken. Mm -hmm. uh, the human rights body has been reasonably outspoken, if you like. The Food Agency World Food Program has been very clear. The Refugee Agency UNHCR has been clear, if you like. The World Health Organization has drawn attention to the terrible health crisis. UNICEF has told us a great deal about the uh, suffering to, to, to families and emphasized uh, everything that's going on. This is a sea change over the last 20 years. Mm. But what is also a sea change is that whereas 
Kofi Annan, who presided over, uh, over uh, Rwanda genocide and Srebrenica genocide, mm. uh, uh, if, if you like to see, or oh, Antarfur, because he was my first yeah. at the time. Yeah. He at least spoke up, even if afterwards. Mm. And he said, I remember, he said, I'm sorry. Today, Secretary General Antonio Guterres, as you will also have seen this, I do not know what is the point of Antonio Guterres or what is the point of the political function of the uh, of United Nations. We mustn't blame the UN because the UN, of course, is a, is a club, club of, men, of member states. Mm. And I've already said it's important we make a distinction between the political part of the UN, that is the UN Secretariat led by the Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres nowadays, and the many useful institutions of the UN in every sector you can think of from development to humanitarian to technical areas, etc., who are doing brilliant work wherever they are allowed to do, and they try and do those works as honestly and diligently as they can, and the resources allow and access allows. Okay, very important when we speak of the UN, we are clear who we are talking about. You see, we should also be clear that it is incorrect to say that just because the United Nations Security Council is paralyzed by the likes of China or Russia, mostly China, that somehow we can let uh, uh, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, off the hook. If you read the United Nations Charter, and I suggest everyone should go on the internet and read the UN ch Charter, which is one of the most beautiful documents in the world. And my hat's off to the people who wrote it all those years ago after the uh, Second World War. You will see that the Secretary General has powers himself to convene the Security Council or to demand that he brief the Security Council in an open setting. And then also, in fact, this is what Kofi Annan did. When, when I spoke up in Darfur and the Security Council was not interested, uh, 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 Secretary General, uh, 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 you know, uh, Kofi Annan um, actually, uh, you know, insisted that he brief the Security, uh, security Council. And uh, Jan Egeland, who was uh, the uh, emergency coordinator at that time, at that age is Mark Lokok of that time, if you like to see, was, uh, you know, completely there to do, do the briefing. It was not a closed session. It was not a kind of secret session. It was an open session. Anyone could, uh, could go there and, and, and listen to it. We don't have that now. And I really think that today, the primary responsibility for the is, uh, is not in uh, one or two member states uh, who, of course, need to bear responsibility, especially uh, P5 countries like, uh, like China. But principally, the chief person who is missing in action, lost in non-combat, is Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who has not just shown no leadership, but by his silence, he has shown negative leadership. And through that act, emboldened the powers that are committing these genocidal acts in, uh, in Tigray. A lot has changed in the last 10, 15 years in terms of the international architecture. On the positive side, we have uh, more and more UN agencies willing and able to speak up freely and frankly in areas of their responsibility be it the refugee agency, UNHCR, be it the food agency, uh, uh, the World Food Programme, be it uh, WHO for health, uh, or the development agencies, and certainly the humanitarian uh, agencies like OCHA. Unfortunately, what has happened on the negative side, what we see is that at least as far as the current Secretary General Antonio Guterres is concerned, he is probably the weakest SG that we've seen in recent times. And his silence in the case, not just of Tigre, but in relation to many other human rights crises around the world, it is astonishing that he hasn't said anything. You know, um, people often say that uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. And in this uh, age, uh, what we mean by that is, that words, whether it's on social media or the uh, or words from whichever platform you occupy, uh, they have the power 
to either uh, do good or uh, do harm. But one thing that always does harm is silence. So I'm just very disappointed to see that Antonio Guterres at the present time, by his astonishing silence, lack of courage, is not only just failing to bring comfort to the people suffering from atrocities like in Tigray and other places, by the way, but the silence is encouraging the perpetrators. Because every time you're silent, especially when you speak from a high platform like that of the Secretary General, and you're silent from the platform, what it means is you're giving uh, a signal to the, uh, to the people and saying, boys, please carry on, do, you, do your worst, because I'm closing my eyes, if you like. Hear no evil, see no, uh, see no evil. Hmm. Essentially, that's Guterres' uh, policy. And so it leads me to question, what is the purpose of the of the uh, Secretary General in this particular context? Mm. Uh, if you read your uh, UN Charter, the Secretary General has considerable power that he can exercise. But this Secretary General seems to hide behind the Security Council. And uh, he, he doesn't seem to be able to use his own independent powers to demand the Security Council to listen to him. And if the Security Council cannot officially listen, but hide in closed meetings and informal briefings, then don't be surprised if actually the highest court of in the land, in the in the on the uh, on the globe, the Security Council is actually missing. We have a Secretary General who is missing in action, and we, we have got a Security Council that is uh, also missing, uh, missing from all all, all this. Mm. And the Secretary General cannot hide behind. Uh, certain uh, 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 member states who are uncooperative. So uh, uh, certainly China is being extremely obstructive because uh, it is uh, itself under uh, attack for its human rights abuses in uh, uh, Xinjiang and uh, other places. Mm. And of course, uh, Russia has its own uh, problems. But it's easy for Antonio Guterres to hide behind the Chinas of this world. In fact, it suits him. You know, so he's not using his power that the previous secretary generals have used at a time where the geopolitics were equally tough. Mm. You know, we think that well, geopolitics are difficult at the moment. Believe me, I've been dealing uh, with uh, these situations, including when I was in a high uh, position in a P5 country and often went to uh, New York for United Nations uh, meetings. You see, the geopolitics of those ages and geop were, were tough. But geopolitics today are tough, but they're no tougher than, than in the past. Mm. So I think that's an important issue, which brings us to another point, a, a more positive point. I, I see now uh, recently that national parliaments, many countries in Europe, mm. uh, even in the United States, the dem democratically elected representatives mm. of peoples in several nations have taken it upon themselves to call a situation uh, genocide or gross abuse of human rights. You see, we have seen that in Belgium now and in some other Eastern European countries, and we've seen it in the United States, I think even in Canada. And so, uh, uh, and even in the British Parliament, they have made a resolution about the Uyghurs. Mm. What does that mean? That means that when it comes to crimes against humanity, which are of an egregious nature, and uh, as I've said, a crime against humanity in one place is a crime against all humanity everywhere. Mm. This becomes a matter for universal jurisdiction. So if the Security Council will not act and the International Criminal Court cannot act because the International Criminal Court needs referral by a member state or mm. the Security Council. In, in my case in Darfur, I managed to get the International Criminal Court because I threatened that we would boycott the Beijing Olympics by calling them the Genocide Olympics. Mm. And China at the time, which wasn't so powerful as it is now, was so afraid to lo lose uh, its face that they it abstained from the Security Council resolution, which referred the case of Darfur to, uh, uh, to the International Criminal Court. And the rest, as you know, uh, is evolving, uh, evolving history. Mm. My, my point here is that if the international community is paralyzed, either because of the cowardice of the Secretary General or the misbehavior of some powerful states, 
it doesn't mean to say that the world has come to an end. It doesn't mean to say that we uh, we go home and uh, weep into our tea. Uh, countries can act. Actually, any country can act because these are crimes of uh, universal uh, importance. Mm. And so what we see in the, in the course of the last few decades is that international law is evolving. That, uh, and this is what Gambia did when it uh, complained to the International Court of Justice about Myanmar. And finally, uh, the Myanmar Rohingya case went to the International Court of Justice. Mm. And uh, the determination of the ICG was that indeed genocidal acts were taking place in uh, in relation to the to the Rohingya. Now, Gambia had nothing to do with uh, with uh, with Myanmar. It's a small African country. Most people don't even know where it is on the map. If you uh, if you if you if you like, see, my God, this tiny African country mm -hmm. took it upon itself to mm -hmm. take this matter to uh, uh, to the International Court of Justice when the powerful nations could not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my feeling is that we live at an age where many things are possible now. Mm -hmm. Crimes that hide behind silence can no longer stay hidden, regardless of cowards who might be in leadership positions, whether at the top of the United Nations or dictators elsewhere, mm. including, for example, the African Union. Mm. Now, we see the situation the African Union is that African Union is complicit in the crimes in Tigray by its silence and by its encouragement of the Ethiopian uh, government. And of course, the seat of the African Union uh, makes it a hostage. Uh, to the government of Ethiopia, uh, uh, where it is. The sooner it moves out, uh, the better it can act independently. Why is there ways uh, forward that uh, we can, I think, continue to make progress to for accountability in the case of Tigray? Mm. Mm. You, you, somewhere you made a, a very important point where you say, you know, sometimes we rely on institutions, but we forget the people in the institutions who play a critical role. So in your case, in Darfur, you were, you know, um, strong enough, well documenting everything, you know, even flying down, I mean, lower to take pictures and send them live from uh, your, you know, helicopters and so on. Uh, then you had no one to, you know, who would listen to you in the office, right, in the main office. And now it's a kind of reverse where, um, not reverse, but uh, you have these uh, equivalent people like uh, you are mentioning, uh, Mark, actually he has been very consistent uh, from the get-go. Uh, there are people, at least from last week's session on the US and uh, EU, uh, people who are disappointed, for example, in terms of uh, uh, Madame Patton or when, she was referring government, Ethiopian government sources as, you know, uh, it's being taken care of, somebody's, you know, into the court and so on. So this relationship between government, uh, that leads me to the question of investigation and how countries, you know, see uh, whatever they do in that country instead of listening to people uh, like you and so on. So how do you, how do you look at how U.S. is handling this situation compared maybe to your experiences before. Uh, you, we can talk about U.K., your um, country, uh, and uh, you, you're encouraging them actually last night, I guess, on um, how they uh, are um, dealing with that and so on. Of course, the big elephant in the room is Eritrea, where uh, Feldman went there, and we don't know what happened. Uh, and uh, we are still, you, you were mentioning a couple of times, there was a promise of withdrawal, but nothing happens, right? Uh, so uh, even my own country, Canada, how do you just assert this? And vis-a-vis -vis what you are mentioning, uh, the Security Council, uh, or what can nations like as small as Gambia uh, can do in terms of changing you know, the uh, whole picture? I think uh, if we have a critical mass of individuals, either in private life, but with influence, or in public institutions, even when other people in the same institution are uh, uh, cowardly, mm. then I think the momentum really builds up. So 
I'm quite optimistic that with the amount of data we have now independently, and that's the other thing, by the way, that uh, unlike the time of the Nazis when the data came afterwards, today mm -hmm. we have technology and science and epidemiology at our disposal. In fact, I'm, a, uh, I'm an epidemiologist, a medical scientist, if you like, mm -hmm. and I have been using the same techniques that I've been uh, using to study COVID in Africa that I've been involved in also. Mm. Exactly the same techniques to study the epidemiology of the violence in Tigray. Mm. It is exactly the same. One is the virus of the, of the corona variety. The mm. other is the virus of the genocidal variety. Technology and uh, approaches are, are, are similar. Mm. If you put all that uh, uh, together, and then, and we have some good in human rights institutions, humanitarian institutions, and individuals uh, we have discussed. Mm -hmm. And I know people like uh, Samantha Parr and uh, and uh, Linda, the current U.S. ambassador. I know them from my past dealings with them uh, mm -hmm. in the, in different different roles. Well, I really think the wind is blowing in the right direction, and it is against Asmara and it's against Addis. Mm -hmm. But we cannot be complacent. And the reason for this is that what will happen, in my opinion, is that uh, Addis will succumb. Sooner or later, the pressure on Addis will be too much. Mm. But, and my worry is that it will say, OK, OK, we'll give you a ceasefire. And yes, you can have access. And yes, you can help anyone you like and come in. Mm. But it will only do that once the genocide has reached the final solution. So my worry is that all this call for humanitarian ceasefire, what they do is they are buying time for the genocidal policies of uh, Addis, of the government in Addis, to actually uh, go to the final steps. And then they'll say, OK, now you, can, now you can come in. Hence, a sense of urgency is needed. This is why one of the things I'm disappointed about when humanitarians speak about this subject, they speak about it as a humanitarian crisis. So if you look at all the tweets, uh, even from uh, the EU, uh, the humanitarian uh, part of the EU, or even the political part of the EU, they don't talk about the human rights crisis. They talk about the humanitarian crisis. This is not a humanitarian crisis. This is a human rights crisis. There are humanitarian consequences, but it's not the humanitarian side that is, uh, that is in the lead. Extremely important point uh, in this. And one thing we must also understand is that if you are a person of a genocidal mindset, and by the way, I have met many genocidal uh, leaders. I actually sat with Milosevic in Belgrade, the, the, the uh, granddaddy of the, of the uh, genocide in Srebrenica uh, with the British foreign minister. I was uh, with him in Belgrade during the, uh, the business. I have, a, I have a, I've sat with the genocides in the Sudanese government, mm -hmm. President al-Bashir and his people in his office masterminding this, uh, the, the Janjaweed. And I met the- Somewhere actually you say dining with the- Dining uh, with the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so one thing I learned is that, that by definition, those who are perpetrating crimes against humanity in this way, they are not amenable mm -hmm. to appeals of conscience or morals. Mm -hmm. Because if they were vulnerable, to appeals of morality, conscious of humanitarianism, then they wouldn't be committing these acts in the first place. Mm. So this is what we are all making the mistake of. We are saying, oh, please, these people are suffering. Oh, look, they're dying. Oh, look at this mother rape. Look at this picture of a starving uh, child. Please, please, uh, you know, let us allow us to give us some humanitarian uh, aid. These appeals do not work. They mm. didn't work in the case of Hitler. They didn't work in the case of Pol Pot. They didn't work in the case of the Hutus, uh, and they're not going to work in the case of Eritrea particularly, and I don't think they're going to work in the case of uh, Ethiopia, uh, except through some overwhelming kind of uh, effect, like uh, impeding Ethiopia's uh, ability to conduct the, 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 the warfare, and certainly uh, same, in, same in Eritrea. Mm. So what I'm saying is we must talk more about accountability and justice, mm. And while we must emphasize the humanitarian side to draw it to the world's attention, mm -hmm. we mustn't justify what the actions we take mm -hmm. on the grounds of simply uh, humanitarian relief and humanitarian access, important, uh, important as that is, if you like. 
because we will get the humanitarian access. I'm quite sure of that. But it will be by the time you get the humanitarian access, it is too late. And I experienced that myself in Rwanda. I experienced that myself in uh, in Bosnia, and I and I saw it with my own eyes, even at close range uh, in in Darfur. So, uh, so I think uh, the independent inquiry into the investigation of human rights is absolutely fundamental. Mm. But the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is uh, not the vehicle for this. Because OCHR is a great body, and the High Commissioner, uh, she does a great job, and a lady of uh, for whom one has nothing but the highest respect. But she, the, her office has no legal authority. You know, she can write as many reports uh, as she uh, as you like. In the same way, Amnesty can write as many reports as Amnesty likes, or Human Rights uh, Watch can uh, publish whatever uh, whatever they like with huge details uh, in them. There is no executive uh, kind of uh, lever uh, attendant on that. Mm -hmm. The only authority where uh, an inquiry results in a statutory action founded in international law is the Security Council, if you like. And this is what happened in the case of Darfur. It's only when the, when the Security Council referred the matter to the ICC, and the ICC didn't do a joint inquiry with the government of Sudan, who, which was committing the genocide, it invited the Sudanese government to give evidence and to cooperate, which of course they didn't at that moment in in time. But uh, the point is that the current situation, where there is a uh, proposal or is underway that uh, uh, some kind of joint inquiry between a normative office of the United Nations called the Office of the Human Rights, uh, great people that they are, but they have no status, they have no standing. The Human Rights Council has had no authority. If you like, and pass as many resolutions, uh, you know, as, as you wish, mm -hmm. alongside the, with the Ethiopian uh, uh, human rights in institution. Well, obviously, an inquiry needs a cooperation of a government. Uh, good if the Ethiopian uh, collaborate, but what kind of a justice is it where the police uh, say, in, imagine if there was a uh, uh, a crime happening on my street, a mass murder going out, uh, happening down there, or even one murder out there, taking. And uh, and uh, the uh, judge says, okay, let's uh, make an inquiry into the murder. Let us do a joint inquiry between uh, the the uh, potential uh, criminals, perpetrators, mm -hmm. and the uh, victims or the survivors among the, among the victims. And, you, know, you would say, you would be right to say, what kind of justice is this? Is this going to be fair justice we are going to get? So this is a ridiculous and absurd situation we are in, where going down this route of a joint inquiry between OHCHR and the Ethiopian Human Rights Institution is not just useless, but it is worse than that. It is providing a fig leak or an alibi behind which the Addis government can disappear. Mm, yeah, actually, you know, that, that's a very important you just made because uh, the worst of, uh, I mean, what makes this absurd at all is uh, since the start of the war, the head of that commission uh, was on record, you know, just in public saying, uh, covering, undermining, like we said before. So it, it's supposed to be, or at least in a symbolic way, it's independent or arm's length from the government. But let, let's just, uh, I won't play some seconds from that uh it is comforting to learn that uh you know the 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 the, the military operation did not result in as severe consequences as it was uh, originally feared to be uh there was uh, there was talk of a huge bloodbath there was talk of a huge uh, uh civilian uh casualties and uh you know a breaking up of the country and the country being in a bloodbath and so on, you know, which I, I can understand are uh, legitimate concerns uh, for any observer uh, and for all of us here in Ethiopia. You know, it was uh, it, it was quite a stressful several weeks uh, for, for anyone who has followed Ethiopia. Uh, but as uh, the military operation unfolded, uh, it was comforting to learn that uh, the, the much hyped about and the much uh, uh, talked about uh, blood pass did not really happen, uh, at least to the extent uh, it has been uh, uh, anticipated to be. 
So this uh, is it's comforting to learn uh, that th this is the man you know with which the uh, Human Rights Commission from the UN is uh, working, and uh, UMD Media can uh, reveal that credible sources uh, told us even the joint uh, investigation that has just started is dominated with manpower everything by this uh, commission, Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. So the point you are making, actually you are clear in the tweet where from your own experience, you didn't allow anyone from Khartoum, including even from New York, you know, to influence what you are uh, doing in terms of da data assembly and uh, getting the facts right and so on. So I just want to pick your brain on that uh, in terms of your experience and how this, like I said, this credible information that I have, that it's a kind of, just doing it for the sake of doing it. Why? Well, I think uh, obviously the uh, perpetrators uh, uh, want an alibi. They are still members of the international community and especially Ethiopia had a, a, a gradually positive reputation that was growing, both for development as well as for uh, uh, progressing in the nation. And when this misbehavior on the part of the government resulted in a shock to the national reputation, obviously it's going to do everything it can to regain that. And naturally, it wants to be some kind of international body to whitewash what it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been doing. The purpose of justice is to bring accountability. And the purpose of accountability is to bring peace. Again, from my experience of many situations in the last 40 years, and not just genocidal situations, but other places where I, I worked in the humanitarian development area, like Sierra Leone, Mozambique, and elsewhere, you cannot have peace without accountability. And you cannot bring accountability without justice. And you cannot do justice without justice also being seen to be done. Because if you don't have justice, not just justice, but justice seen to be done, mm -hmm. nobody believes in it. And therefore the people you're trying to demonstrate that, uh, okay, terrible things have happened, please, can we bring uh, restitution? Can we bring redress? Can we move on and can we heal, et cetera, et cetera, all those things which will have to happen eventually, they will not happen which makes which convinces me that unfortunately the current government in, uh, in Addis Ababa is not interested in finding a resolution to the conflict in Tigray. If the government of Ethiopia, as currently represented by its prime minister and uh, those around him, was seriously interested in, re in resolving this genocidal violence in uh, Tigray and restoring the nation's unity and healing the people and resuming the path of development and, and bringing help and development to all its people in all over, all over the, the, uh, this uh, country, then what it would be saying is, come, please help us. Mm. Please make your inquiry. Please do it freely, independently, but mm. allow us to give our side of the case also, mm. because all sides of the case deserve to be, to be read. Uh, you know, even murderers and criminals uh, you know, uh, have to have lawyers to to represent them. That's only fair, mm. if you like. But because it is completely blackballing everything, stonewalling on everything, it convinces me that the government is engaged in an orchestrated ethnic cleansing, mm. because of the logic of which is to complete the job. Mm. The biggest threat to 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 uh, to the government in Addis is that it leaves the job half done. Mm. Because when you leave the job half done, the survivors and uh, those who are resisting will come back and hit you even harder, if you like to see. Mm. So, uh, of course, we know, and these people are misguided. We know that genocides never work. I mean, the Jews did not get uh, annihilated. Mm. Uh, still, uh, they came back, 
and every uh, the uh, community comes back. Nobody's been annihilated except for some small tribes uh, many years ago, many decades ago in in in, in countries, mm -hmm. right? So here I'm trying to say is that this is an additional point in the case that the regime in uh, Addis Ababa is not interested in in actually doing justice accountability, mm. which are essential steps on the path to uh, solutions uh, and uh, and moving on. Mm -hmm. That depresses me very much. Yeah, I know. Uh, 2012, you went actually to the border. Uh, I think you spent 10 days there in the, in uh, Sudan, right? Uh, there, uh, you were talking about how the government bombs areas and, you know, the people leave the place and then other people come and occupy that place. That's exactly what's happening in Western Tigray, especially with renaming everything, including churches, you know, uh, renaming churches, renaming places and uh, uh, giving it to um, other people who were, who were purposely moved to that area after pushing the other. So this is uh, your tweet, uh, a couple of tweets from yesterday emphasizing the importance of this uh, independent investigation, um, how it's important uh, from uh, moral to, you know, uh, uh, everything uh, and so on. So you are talking about how toothless that could be if it's uh, going the way it's uh, being planned and so on. So I, I kept you for long. So I want to finish with uh, how the future uh, looks like. This is uh, actually related to the Canada financing this uh, so-called uh, investigation. But the future, uh, I want to talk about uh, what you see play out. You mentioned Belgium, which is an interesting development where uh, they start. They started, you know, uh, filing a court case uh, using uh, victims uh, uh, whose family perished or uh, uh, sexually raped and so on. All that. So, is this something that we may need to push for, given that the international machinery uh, has a lot of? Uh, you know, gears, bolts, and nuts to uh, uh, bring together? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, ultimately justice has to be individual justice. Ultimately, accountability is always personal. You know, so uh, when we say the Nazis did terrible things, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was only when you brought it down to the level of individuals doing nasty things to named other individuals that we saw justice accountability and then moving moving on, if you like. Similarly, if individual survivors or, or representatives of those who have died, I hate the word victim because that sounds very powerless. Nobody is a victim. Everyone is a survivor. And even when you're dead, you are resisting because your soul and, you, and your memory is resisting and you must not be allowed to forget uh, when you die, because you are a symbol of that re of that resistance, even when you are dead. If they, wherever they are in the world, can bring cases for personal hurt and grievance, including rape and torture and all those kinds of things, then in suitable jurisdictions, then that obliges the laws of suitable states to act, and don't understand, don't uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, miss, uh, underplay the law. Because uh, let me just uh, digress a bit. When the International Criminal Court was set up uh, and uh, I was one of the people pushing for it at the time, everyone was skeptical. They said, oh, well, no one is going to cooperate. Nothing is going to happen. Oh, it's another talk show. Nothing is happening. But once the, the, the wheels of justice start grinding, even if they are very slow, <laughs> they're very difficult to stop. Mm -hmm. Even now, the, 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 the cases that were slowly, slowly brought before the court in The Hague, they are grinding on, including some, some uh, actual um, uh, judgments have been, have been, have been passed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my point here is, we have to be creative. The law is advancing all the time, and individuals, as well as countries, can come in. And the more we have of this, 
And the more we we bring a case against named individuals, whether it's a general in the Eritrean uh, army, whether it is their representative, whether it is the what is it, whether it is their uh, representative or in in a, in a, in, a, in a, of a company that is selling them arms mm -hmm. and make complicit in in the murder, it raises the bar of uh, getting away uh, with, with 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 impunity, if you, if you like to see. Mm. And this is one of the reasons why dictators. Uh, hate these uh, mechanisms, you know, and they need to also learn a little bit from history. Every single genocidal uh, leader since the Second World War, and including the Second World War, mm. has ultimately been deposed and uh, uh, rushed out of power, and either uh, either they died uh, during the during the resistance or they were produced in the court of law. No one has ever succeeded. Mm -hmm. So if Prime Minister Abbey and those around him think that they can get away with this in Tigray, well, history is, the, uh, he hasn't studied his history. Look at his neighbor Bashir, uh, you know, who was such a powerful man in, in Sudan at a time when Sudan was Africa's biggest country. Uh, uh, when I was head of the UN there, it was of the United Sudan. It was Africa's biggest country. Mm. And he was in power for decades and decades, if he likes, in a way, you see. And then he went, if you like. And he went by a combination of external pressure and internal pressure, a combination of resistance, both armed resistance, but more importantly than that was a social resistance. Because when the people of Darfur made common cause, with the other oppressed people of Sudan. It wasn't just a problem of the marginalized minorities of Darfur, Blue Nile, Abia, uh, uh, you know, or the Nuba Mountains. Mm. But because dictators have a pattern of behavior, the mm. same pattern that they terrorized Darfur was also terrorizing Arabs in the mainland, in the Nile belt. In the mainland of Sudan. And sooner the oppressed, both the marginalized oppressed like the Darfuris and the mainland oppressed made common cause. And when they did, this became a core national issue, not just an issue of marginalized issue. Mm. So here what I'm saying is two things need to happen. The, the genocide in Tigray must be resisted by every means possible. I've said that publicly a number, a number of times. Mm. I'm a man. I don't advocate violence in any way. I, I I can't even tell one end of a gun from another end of a gun if you were to put one in my in in my in my hand. But mm. I am not going to say that when you are threatened and the life of your wife is threatened, your daughters are being raped, your mother is being abused, that you don't have the right to defend yourself. Mm. Even international uh, customary law says you have the right to defend yourself by whatever means necessary. Apart from that, I would suggest the message from the Tigray side should be to the rest of the people in Ethiopia who are also suffering. Mm. And some of the suffering people have, have committed terrible things against the Tigrayans. Mm. And the Tigrayans in the past have committed terrible things against uh, other communities as well in, in Ethiopia. This is unfortunately what happens in, uh, has happened in Ethiopia's long history. In the same way that in my country of birth in India, all communities have done terrible things against each other if you look into the into the history of the of, of the of the country so i'm saying a combination of external pressures that are going on domestic mobilization of outrage building of bridges between oppressed people whoever you are tigran or amara or any other uh, community or ethnic group that uh, you know more about hmm. combined with the global solidarity of oppressed people. The reason I often lump Tigray together with Rohingya, the reason I talk about Tigray at the same time that I talk about the Uyghurs, mm. if, uh, if, if you like, is because it is only when we have solidarity between the oppressed people, mm. wherever they are in the world, when the Tigrayan problem becomes a problem of the, of the Burmese people, Mm. The Burma's problem becomes a problem of the Ethiopian people. 
in the way that the Rohingya problem became the problem of the Gambian people, mm. uh, uh, if you like, that we are going to really be able to stand together mm. and uh, uh, ensure that this genocide uh, is uh, not not completed. Mm. So these are the elements of a strategy, a strategy, if you, if you like. And the, and the, the, the conclusion is, is absolutely clear. Uh, this government will be removed. No, uh, because uh, no uh, genocidal dictator in history has ever survived. It may take a year, it may take a month, it may take 10. Mm. But uh, this government will go. It mm. will be removed. Mm. The only choice for the, for the Ethiopian government at the present time and the Eritrean government working uh, together is what is the form in which they will go? Will they go in a sensible way and allow the countries both Ethiopia and Eritrea to move on, or they will go through a bloodbath that is going to spread and spread and spread. Mm. It will develop not just uh, Ethiopia uh, or the region of Ethiopia, it will envelop the whole of uh, that part of Africa, if not further afield. This is what we've seen also in other situations where infection spreads. You can't mm. control these kinds of existentialist violence by the uh, on the boundaries it's like it's like covid in that respect mm. the borders but the, but the virus spread all over the has spread all over the, all over the world mm. and this will happen here mm. and sooner or later it'll it'll go but mm. our duty now is to try and uh, have it sooner rather than later simply mm. to reduce the human cost of what is inevitable mm. Very, very important and powerful assessment there. And uh, uh, I can't help but ask you about, given your long list of you know countries where you see these nasty things happening, genocide happening, and so on, uh, during or after, and so on. Uh, how do you see? Because some people, some of my guests say, you know, this is unheard of to invite a sitting government in the central government inviting a neighboring country and other countries to annihilate you know its own people uh, so uh, how, how do you see this uh, uh, assessment for, from people like me and my guests uh, who said that is unheard of well i would say it is certainly a sign of impunity that addis can call in asmara and uh, of course denied it for a few seconds earlier on, but quickly admitted it. And now, uh, you know, even justified it by saying, oh, well, they did it because they were attacked and they did it to protect them, et cetera. That is unheard of. And that points to a degree of boldness of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a feeling of impunity when a government can actually do that and invite the neighboring government to come and murder its own, its, own, its own people. Even Hitler manufactured fake reasons to, to, to invade Poland, if you like. If you go back mm -hmm. to Having said that, I think uh, uh, getting uh, a neighbor or uh, some other country to help you in your evil acts, but do it uh, uh, under the table, is not unknown. So, for example, in the case of Sudan, uh, we know that uh, there was a involvement of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, Libya uh, at uh, certain times uh, in the genocidal violence in uh, in uh, in uh, Darfur, mm -hmm. employing the pan-Arab uh, kind of bond between uh, very fundamental Islamist Khartoum and mm -hmm. the Libyan regime at that time. Mm -hmm. It was because of that. And because of the pouring out of refugees into neighboring uh, um, uh, Chad um, uh, and uh, other uh, other neighboring countries, Central African Republic, and so on, that I, as a United Nations uh, coordinator at the time, could say, "Well, this is no longer no longer a domestic matter. This mm -hmm. is a threat to international peace and security." When you have neighboring countries uh, mm. supplying uh, bombs and helicopters, I mean the Sudanese Air Force couldn't fly sophisticated aircraft. Mm. You know, they came from outside. The mm. Sudanese, uh, uh, you know, pilots uh, uh, could barely read a map, uh, let alone precision bomb uh, mm. black uh, tribal groups' villages and mm. leave un unharmed the uh, villages of a, a different ethnic group uh, uh, two kilometers away. That mm. required 
a degree, a degree of sophistication mm -hmm. that Soviet military did not have by itself. Mm -hmm. It had uh, external assistance uh, uh, with that, making it an international uh, uh, threat to international peace and security, as we know. Mm -hmm. Similarly, mm -hmm. uh, the same thing is happening here. But yes, you're right, uh, mm -hmm. and your other guests uh, uh, are right. I never heard of a nation brazenly uh, doing this and publicly doing it and almost rejoicing in, in, in doing it. Mm. Uh, and that is further evidence to, for me that if this matter were to appear in front of an international court, these kinds of actions will be collateral evidence for the case against Addis uh, and against uh, Asmara. Mm. That this was part of a coordinated, planned, organized, strategic alliance. Mm. When that happens, then one of the criteria for proving genocidal intent is satisfied. Mm. Mm. So the more this thing goes on, the more it seems that uh, that uh, you know these governments are uh, kind of uh, <laughs> digging their. I don't want to the grave, but uh, but definitely they they will go. They will have to go. Definitely. So my last question is: I want to reconnect what where we started, where uh, uh, Darfur. So 2004, you met Aisha, and uh, actually in 2014, you talk about her. So I want to just play that video and a very short clip. And then uh, I will ask you to speak to the Aisha of Tigray. And for me, this clip, this short clip where you talk about Aisha, every word is something that I heard of somebody in Tigray. So uh, let's play it. Aisha has somehow traveled 1,000 kilometers across the burning sands from Tawila in northern Darfur. She's obviously someone very special. Listen to her Aisha's story. They raped me. They hitched up my ropes and one Janjaweed took me. Then another, then another. Twelve times, I think. My old father, my husband, my two young sons had to watch. And as they violated me, they insulted me. They call me Zurka and Abid, dirty black slave. And they shouted how they were going to give me fine Arab babies. They did it to a hundred others. Some were just girls of six. I can still hear their screaming. Others, grandmothers of 65. It was like a factory production line. Deep into the night, and long after Aisha has left, I sit alone in my airless cartoon office. What had made her risk life and limb to travel so far to share her intimate story of pain and suffering with a total stranger? Why did she have confidence that I would act to right her wrongs? Was it because she thought that I was the United Nations. Very powerful. Um, so today we have, you know, this. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, you know, for me, these things are not academic uh, exercises or uh, or exercises in uh, geopolitics or some kind of a uh, game. Uh, these are, um, uh, these are uh, uh, flesh and blood. These are, uh, these are uh, real. And yeah, I mean, Asha actually totally changed my life. Yeah, I know, I know. And, um, you know, you mentioned at uh, the end, uh, I'm so sorry, you know, uh, uh, because I found it, this thing, like you said, repeating itself, never again has been in practice become again and again and again and again. Uh, but what comforts me and what 
should comfort the people of Tigray or elsewhere, you know, in all, in all parts of the world is there are people like you who will not keep silent. He will, against all odds, you know, uh, be the same person respective of who is a victim with the, uh, the receiving end of this uh, genocidal atrocities and uh, war. Um, yeah. Well, I mean... I'm so sorry. Uh, no, 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 don't be sorry. If uh, it is just, uh, it just brought back uh, uh, memories um, of my own, uh, 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 if you like, frustration. Because there I was, uh, the head of the United Nations at that time, and, uh, it was the, the biggest UN operation under my command uh, because Iraq had not quite happened yet. What was happening, and so it was the biggest UN operation I was heading. And uh, here I was in the most powerful position, of the, uh, you know, of the biggest UN operation, and I was powerless to help one woman, uh, if you like, you see. And it just, it, it, that I just uh, was, uh, of course, frustrating. And my powerlessness, despite being so powerful. But it's the one that made me extremely angry. And can I also say, just as an addition, because I'm in your program and you were speaking from Canada, mm -hmm. and I can't let this opportunity go by without uh, wishing the most famous Canadian of all, Janet Dillaire, a mm -hmm. happy 75th birthday, uh, which is around now. And uh, so General Dallaire, who stood up in Rwanda and was deeply traumatized by that, actually reached out to me uh, after I came out of uh, Darfur. And, I'm, I, and I was in one of my completely confused states, as one is, how to be so powerful and yet so powerless, how to have huge resources at your command, but be entirely incapable of helping one person. Mm -hmm. uh, if you like, is an and you know and General Dillaire, who I then I don't know how we connected. Uh, we actually met in Rome. He was on a tour of uh, Europe, and I went from Geneva to Rome to meet with him in the in the Canadian Embassy in in, in Rome at his invitation, and he gave me enormous courage about uh, about uh, you know uh, uh, kind of uh, being resolved. And uh, Delaire said to me that he, uh, he admired me for what I was doing in Darfur, what I had done in Darfur. And I said, come on, Doc, uh, General Delaire, it's you who are the, the man who should be, uh, who st stood up and, and uh, did so much in, in Rwanda. And then he said to me uh, something that I haven't forgotten. And that his greatest regret is that as a military man, he felt he had to obey orders until the last moment. In my case, because I'm not a military man and I don't have to obey any orders except the orders of my own conscience, I could say what I wanted at the time that I wanted in that form. So if I, have a, uh, if I have a message to anyone out there, apart from the uh, Aishas of uh, Tigre, which I will come to, but before I come to Aisha of Tigre, let me say this to every single humanitarian worker, of any organization, local or international, every single person trying to do good, speak up, don't be afraid, do your little act, and you'll be surprised that the act of doing it good is the ultimate resistance that, uh, that against which the genocide will always fail. And uh, for the Aishas uh, of, uh, of Tigre, of which there are uh, unfortunately uh, you know, far too many, and far more than uh, some of the very small numbers that have been being quoted by some UN agencies. I would say, I'm sorry for your sacrifices. I'm sorry that never again has happened again, and it's happening on our collective uh, patch, but their suffering is not going to be forgotten. That we dedicate ourselves, whoever we are, whether we are Ethiopian, Tigrayan, or any other nationality, if you like, but these are all a common humanity, uh, uh, if you like, that from what is going on in, in Tigray, what has happened in Tigray, and suffering the rapes that cannot be reversed, the killings that cannot bring back people to life, and the destruction 
can be repaired, but it will not be the same, uh, this, uh, the same again. But what will grow from that is something even, even, even better. So the price that you're paying Aisha, uh, Aisha of uh, uh, Tigray is a foundation for a future for which you sacrifice yourself and for which we pledge ourselves that it will not be forgotten. And the collateral uh, message is, as in Darfur, Aisha actually, her uh, sisters, they have built, rebuilt their lives. They moved on. They are rebuilding, not perfectly. The insult and injury will always be there. The hurt will always be there, you know. But the fact is that Bashir is now sitting in jail. Mm -hmm. There is a new government in Khartoum, not a perfect government, mm -hmm. not full justice has not been done, but a change is slowly happening, brought about by the by both the people of the country in partnership with like-minded people elsewhere. So I'll say to Asha in, the, in Tigray, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. Don't give up. Don't in any way uh, give up. If we are half as brave as you are, then uh, in the end, uh, this thing will also be overcome. This too will pass. Thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to just read it uh, well, because I'm glad you mentioned uh, General, uh, the Canadian general, where he praised you in the book. In this personal and moving plea, Kapila forces us to look directly into the face of genocide. The ashen wounds of twisted bodies, the hollow eyes of mutilated women, and the insufferable silence of a system that treated some people as more human than others. He spoke truth to power, challenged us to do the same to end such monstrous crimes. And this is a deserved praise uh, in terms of what you did everywhere you went and you didn't stop. Now you are still fighting, even uh, as you mentioned uh, in this show, uh, some trolls uh, trying to, to threaten you and so on. So it was a great pleasure for me to speak to you, to hear what uh, you have to say in terms of the past, the present, and the future of humanity. That's what I uh, gained. That's what I benefited from this show. Thank you so much, Dr. Kapila, uh, for being my guest today. And I am really uh, looking forward to other opportunities, maybe talk about positive you know uh, developments on the humanitarian side because today we were uh, focusing on the atrocities the genocide and so on uh, uh, but i am very grateful for your time today uh, and thank you so much thank you very much uh, thank you for talking to me and uh, my thoughts are with you and all the people out there and let us in solidarity move forward Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye.